Welcome back to another fun field episode of Interior Analysis. I'm David Jones, and I'm here with my co-host. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm Evan Westman. I'm Jelani Kelly. And today we're tackling the movie that confused a nation on how time travel could theoretically work. It's in the hearts of many. It's inspired the neckbeards of a thousand with an adult swim show. Yes, today our episode is Back to the Future. That's a great opening. Oh. A lot of fanfare. It is. Thank you. <laughs> it is. You know, I, gotta, I gotta give them what they want. <laughs> just start as we usually do. I th I'm just gonna go around the virtual table and ask everyone's first impressions of the 1985 classic Back to the Future. So take it away. Uh, I guess I'll start. I think I'm the only one of us that hasn't seen this before. I'm gonna start with some stuff I knew going into this. I knew Professor Plum was a uh, doc. I knew he said Great Scott. Michael J. Fox was in Scrubs. I know at some point the kid's mom tries to bang him. And, and that's all I knew going into this. And also, I thought it was PG. I think it is. For some reason. I think it is. Okay, it is. Great. That's, okay. Why? Well, I I, I want to get into okay. that too because to me it feels like PG thirteen. Yeah, yeah. But um, our Avengers theme guy scored this. Um, I know this was a Rick and Morty in, uh, inspiration, and I, I didn't realize they literally only changed one letter for Morty. I like that Marty isn't a loser. I feel like he's an eighties rom com character. I like the end of his arc, but it's at the beginning. Uh, kinda. Like he has all his confidence. He's got the girl. He's he's got it. He's got it all. I was worried the only black person I was gonna see was uh on a van, but nope. We we got to see some of him in the past when he was working for that white ice cream shop guy. So that was fun. And his name was Goldie, and he had a gold tooth. Representation matters. So, sponsored by Ty Toyota. Then we met his dad, and I was like, oh, his dad's a loser. Great. Also, the bully's name is Biff. It's, I think that's by far the dumbest name I've ever heard for any character. Ever. It is kind of a uh, 50s name, though. Like, 50s. you could name your kid weird Powell, things back in the day. Was Pow taken? What about Kablooey? Was that, was that taken? What, about, what, is, what are some other Batman action sound effects? Sow! Yeah. All of that zapping. Blam! Blam. Was it, were those taken? Shaka poo! Oh, I don't know about that one. <laughs> I don't want to kill. <laughs> Fox did not look like he was in high school when they filmed this. Crispin Glover, the the dad, he was a. Uh, <laughs> he was Biddleman and Like Mike. I don't know if anybody here knows that movie, but that, that's like a. Yes. That's one of my favorite childhood movies. That's actually that's... a good one for a watch along at a future Ooh, time. I haven't yeah. seen that. I've just heard of it. Yeah. Like Mike is that okay, add that to the list, Evan. Like Mike. Okay. It doesn't we'll have to be now. for this first one, but <laughs> And then I thought, Oh, they killed Doc. Isn't this a PG movie? LMAO. And then once the end hit I realized there wasn't any blood when he got shot, huh? Oh yeah, that makes sense. After arriving in the past, why didn't he just stop the fucking car? Why did he keep... He kept his foot on the gas, and there was a good, like, good number of yards. He just he just kept driving until he ran into the poor family's shack. So that was cool. In his defense, he's trying to... I, I hear you there, because I don't think he tries to put on the brakes, but in his defense, he is going 90 miles an hour and trying to go to a complete stop. That wouldn't happen instantly it's a delorean evan you don't think it's capable of that brake hmm? pads in the 80s i don't think were uh at their peak existing they might not have been oh. existent yeah this is a side note but not really this movie would be extremely different if marty was black mm -hmm. just saying <laughs> stuff with his mom was worse than i thought the dinner table scene and then it just ramped up from there i was like all right man why and then I realized that was going to be the whole movie, so that was interesting. And then, like, halfway through the movie, I thought, how the hell did Doc and Marty meet? I don't, I don't remember if they mentioned that. I changed the uh, words when I said smash here, but I said uh, Biff was going to smash his mom, fam, WTF. 
you, you know what Smash is. Yeah. Yeah. But then the climax drags on for way too long for me. With, like, the lightning and all of that. Like, I had been checked out. Like, once he fixed the thing with his dad and mom getting together, I was like, all right, this movie can end now. And then it was, like, a whole nother half hour after that. I was like, all right, we don't need any of this. So, yeah, those are... I I, read, I didn't plan on reading through everything, but I did. Um, those, those are all my initial reactions. I just dropped a link in the chat. I think you would find John Mulaney's uh, stand-up bit about this movie very cathartic because he addresses a lot of that, the stuff you were talking about there. You you want me to watch it while we're... No, no, after. I'm going to reference it later oh. um, because it's it's really great and actually one of the best assessments I've ever heard of this movie. Um, David, are you familiar with that at all? No, I haven't watched it yet, but I'm really excited to see it. Evan, your turn. I saw this for the first time when I was probably like 10, um, which in hindsight, considering like the stuff I wasn't allowed to watch as a kid is a little surprising, but we did kind of have a kick for a while where my parents showed me a lot of 80s movies. And this was never like, I enjoyed it more as a kid than I do now for sure, but it was never like among my favorites. I mean, even among like, I think the far superior 80s time travel movie is Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Yeah, I watched that one. That was good. Oh, you did? Oh, dude. I'm, I'm so happy for you. Um, I don't remember much of it, but I remember liking it when I saw it. I'm so happy to hear that you've seen that. I think I've seen this probably two or three times since then. It's definitely gotten worse for me. I wouldn't say I hate it right now. I wouldn't even say I dislike it, but I feel safe calling it quite overrated. Also, this time watching it, I watched it with my roommate who's an electrical engineer, and they were very vocal about how inaccurate some of the like science stuff is. They kind of went off about how a capacitor is totally not like what the flux capacitor is. And I, I believe they were wearing a t-shirt with a capacitor symbol on it at the time. They were very vocal about... How would he know? Hmm? Well... <laughs> How would he... She's an electrical hmm? engineer. Like... They could just be making it up, you know? We, we had a whole discussion about this a couple hours ago. Because they were saying, like, there were, there were other terms that would have actually made more sense. Like, uh, I can't remember which ones. But... I was like, they would always go back, like, they, it would have been like flux resistor, flux, uh, I don't, I wish I knew electrical terms. But I was like, they always were going to name it the flux capacitor, because that sounds cool. If you named it something different. No, it doesn't. But for a science word, like, it's a very science sounding word. And other science words don't sound as science-y. So they wouldn't have used it, was my argument. They were very upset that, uh. Things were not scientifically accurate. For an 80s movie. Um, by the person who made Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Right. The Polar right. Express. So the peak of accuracy is, is what we expect from Robert yeah. Zemeckis. Uh, what else we got? We got, uh, what's that, Tom Forrest Gump? Yep. Oh, okay. that too. Yep. He just likes Tom Hanks, huh? He might be in love with him. You heard it here first. Mm. What else did he do? He did that weird, like, CGI Beowulf. Oh, that, like, yeah. That, like, looks like the oh, Polar Express. One? Oh. Yeah, I, I hate mm -hmm. that animation style so much. Like, when they try to so make them look real, yeah, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, why? Just, just like at this point, also like I feel Pixar. Like when I watched Soul last year, there's a tangent into animation, but I was like, their animation is so good. I feel like they they're doing things to remind us that this is animation because like. New York in that movie just looks like New York. But they just make the people's heads shaped a little weird. So that you're like, oh right, this is animated. But they could probably make it all photorealistic if they wanted to. Because like, it's that good now. In 2003, it was not. <laughs> My first impression. I wish I knew which number of time this, watching this film this is for me. I rented this movie as a child, blockbuster. And it was, like, I'd always rent, like, two or three really awful horror movies that, like, no child should be allowed to rent. And then, like, one kid's movie. 
And I would often go to like Back to the Future, The Goonies, Dunstan Checks In, written by Bruce Graham, We See You. I would go fluctuate. I would go through a lot of kids' movies. And this one I enjoyed. Rewatching it as an adult, <laughs> I'm really shocked that it's rated PG. It is so not a PG movie, especially in atmosphere where PG-13 was already created. So I figured they would have used it, but they didn't. It was brand new know. at the time, though. It would have been less Yeah, than it was old, a year though. old. They made it in 84, and this came out in 85, so it's still fresh. But I'm just surprised, because the subject matter does get so mature at some times. Like, there is this... I don't know sometimes. if it's true. Yeah, because sometimes it's really, like, crazy light, and... You know, Doc Brown's like, I hit my head on a toilet. And he's like holding Thomas Edison's photo. And he's like, Tom, what do I do? And then other times someone's oh, attempting man. rape. I had a major problem with that this, this time too. Like, and I, I think I did probably bump on it. Like whatever the last time I saw this was, I think I might've been like 17. I don't have a problem with how it's like a time travel movie. That's oh God, I thought you were going to say something else. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm not gonna ask. But thought, I'm not gonna I, ask what. Yeah. Um, I, I, <laughs> I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with the fact that it, like, is a time travel movie that kind of cuts some corners and like has a kind of cartoonish tone. That's fine. I also don't have a problem with a time travel movie doing this like incest undertone thing. But they shouldn't be in the same movie, I think. I think it makes sense that somebody would want to... Like, when you're doing time travel things, it would make sense for someone to go like, Hey, what if you went back in time and one of your parents is attracted to you? Wouldn't that be awkward? Like, somebody's gonna inevitably make that movie. So, okay, fine. What? Do it... Just like. <laughs> but here's the thing, here's the thing. I wouldn't make it, but obviously somebody is going to, inevitably. So, just don't make it a kid's movie with a cartoon tone. And, like, maybe okay. don't have an attempted rape scene be at the center of it. Mm-hmm. Those are things that, like, I think it's okay if that's in a movie, but then don't deal with it like it's Looney Tunes. Because it kind of deals with mm-hmm. it like it's Looney Tunes in this. I'm not saying this needs to be, like, canceled because of it or anything. It just, it really is hard to get past. Yeah. So, and like, I think this would make sense in a Rick and Morty episode. Which, obviously, like, there are ties between that. But, like, that's a show that is a cartoon made for adults. So, that just works there tonally and, like, audience-wise a lot better. Big mouth. Haven't seen it, but that sounds like, yeah, it's something they would do. I mean, since we're talking about it, we could just talk about it. They're, they go back in time, so you hear the whole... When I watch people talk about this movie, everyone likes to point out, like, this movie's taking the age-old like, age question of, if you were went back to high school with your parents, would you be friends with them? And I'm like, it does do that at certain points, but there are other points where it does get a little Oedipus complexy. More than a little. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's all more, undertones, geez. but like it's really obvious undertones. Kisses. Yeah, and I just wonder. And I mean, the movie has had incredible financial reception, critical reception, reception from fans. It's been it's sustained adaptations. Ronald Reagan quoted it in a 1986 State of the Union speech. There's deep fakes of Robert Downey Jr. and Tom Holland. And it's it's not just that. Psycho has it, and that's one of the most studied movies of all time, but most famous movies, like one of the most famous directors of all time. Oedipus, that play itself with Sophocles, why do audiences attach themselves to these storylines so heavily? I don't know why, because I personally don't. I think some of it's nostalgia because at this point, like the eighties is a thing. Incest where... nostalgia? No. The incest nostalgia. Should have maybe the incest given nostalgia a... hits different. Should have maybe <laughs> ordered that differently. Um, <laughs> but I mean, my parents showed me this movie because it would have been like 2009 
and they were like, oh, this is a cool movie from when we were kids, like, nostalgia for us. And also, this came mm-hmm. out in a time where it's like, they would have been nostalgia for the 50s back then. So it's like, oh, cool, here's, like, the diner, and uh, coffee was five cents, or whatever. I, I don't know if... 50s nostalgia hits in this movie and black people weren't allowed yeah that too yeah not nostalgic for (laughs) everyone in the 80s um i i think some of it's nostalgia i i really don't have an explanation for the oedipus stuff like does anybody i don't need an explanation like you're not you didn't write the movie i think there's an explanation out there but i don't know the question Like, how do we feel? Like, it's just, it's curious. I'm curious about it. It's gross. It is gross, but it's so prevalent in all of our entertainment, and it's so interesting. Is it? Yeah. Some of the most, you don't think the Oedipus Complex is rampant. I'm thinking of current movies now. Yeah. I don't think you would do this today, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah. But here's one thing that it does do, and I'm not saying this as, like, an excuse. What it does do is create a dramatic tension that like keeps you interested um you mean sexual tension that too um but i mean even as a 10 year old when i didn't really understand what was happening i still like kind of understood like oh his mom likes him isn't that awkward like that's still registered for me and i i don't know if it may be interested it does keep your attention that's about the best i can say for it i think you still don't need to like again don't do it in a movie for kids like if this is uh who's the guy who does all the comedies uh judd apatow that's who it is like judd apatow doing that like for an adult audience just it has a different undertone and i think that would just work better tonally i don't think this should be marketed to the same audience as goonies is the thing you can still make it, and I think that's fine. But And granted, we're also looking at this from, what is it now, 35 years, 37 years out of context. Like, I guess this flew better in in the 80s. I don't know. I thought he got a hoverboard in this one. Where's the hoverboard? I believe that's the sequel in, that takes place in 2015. Which I haven't seen. Don't they also go to like Yeehaw Times? Where it's like a western? Yeah, I think that's the third. Yeah, that's the third one. David, have you seen those? I have seen those. They are pretty wild. <laughs> yeah, I remember, I, I've I never mean... seen them, but one of my best friends as a kid loved, I think Back to the Future was his favorite first time, and I remember him describing the plots of them to me, and then I've just like seen them referenced other places. So I, like, vaguely know what happens in the sequels. And then there was, I remember in 2015, there was the day that, like, Marty goes to, and people were, like, comparing, like, what came true and what didn't from, like, what they predicted in that. Okay, well, now that we got the overbearing weight of incest and rape out of the way, we can talk we can talk about maybe something a bit more enjoyable to discuss. <laughs> I'll just we'll just go through the movie. I I separated it the first thing into the opening sequence. I think of Greenberg when I watch movies like this. Like and, David the yeah, professor? David Greenberg, yeah. Because he didn't push this movie because he had his favorites that he liked to use as examples, but what he would always say and what he would love to see, like, I feel like this movie exemplifies that because it's just, it's like the basics of screenwriting being put to the test and the fundamentals. And sometimes, and clearly it did, it works. And the opening scene is just that to me. You get a clue into who Marty is. You get a clue into who Doc is. You also understand their dynamic. They start to set up the kind of joke dialogue that they carry throughout the movie where you know marty gets flustered or confused and then doc says something and then marty's like wait doc are you telling me and then ask like some really obvious questions so the audience knows what's happening because it's not making any sense and then doc's like yes marty that's exactly what i'm telling you 
And we understand it's a little bit wacky with all the clocks and him turning up the amp and playing the guitar. And you get his vibe. You get what he wants to do. He likes music, the skateboarding, him being late, him not being responsible. And it kind of starts the ball rolling. Now, I wonder if you guys, when you watched it, were you like, yeah, this is a pretty fundamental, basic opening sequence. Gets the job done. I, I just wanted them to get to the get to the past I wanted them to time travel but I, I know the setup was necessary that's it I didn't really think much of it uh, The m mainly I was just thinking okay this is all necessary this is all character stuff and plot stuff because there's, there's some things going on things being explained prior to the time travel and but mainly I was I was just waiting for the DeLorean I guess I kind of had that a similar reaction at first. If you're talking like the very opening scene in the garage, I've never seen that as particularly impressive or like notable. But now that you're saying it, it does kind of feel like an A plus version of like the screenwriting one assignment where the professor says, go make a scene where we learn a lot about a character without seeing them just from like the environment that like because we do learn a lot about doc brown in that like first shot where it's like panning across his like invention thing that does all his morning routine for him whatever like we are learning about him without seeing him there so that does feel like very screenwriting one basics kind of stuff Aside from that, like, I think it's functional at setting up Marty. And, you know, probably better than functional, but nothing noteworthy. Yeah, I, I don't think it's anything groundbreaking, but I just think sometimes when you're making just, like, a genre movie like this, if you just execute the fundamentals and you do it well, that's hard enough. Yeah. But it's enough for me to sit back and be like, okay, so this movie, that did that. So that's how I, f I wasn't blown away by it, like how Marty was when he played the guitar. Because mm. <laughs> he flew backwards. It was just, you know, screenwriting 101. It's a great, for anyone who wants to get into screenwriting, it's a oh, great scene it. to just read and be like, uh -huh, see, Jelani's there. He got it back in time. Get it? <laughs> 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 yeah. oh, that's good <laughs> the other thing that i really took of notice is the music and that's just because i watched i don't know whose talk show it was but he was on it huey lewis and it wasn't his band it was just him but he was talking about how he wrote a whole the whole soundtrack for this movie specifically and i feel like that's something i see much more common now but i don't really know a lot of movies that got like a rock and roll star back then to just write a whole soundtrack. And it was interesting. It definitely captures the 80s rock feel, in my opinion. But again, it's not like anything like Mozart or Maestro crafting like a beautiful score, but it did, I think, do the job that they wanted him to do. I think it's very 80s, like. 80s scores in like other movies are i'm just gonna say it, they're pretty bad karate kid's a fine movie but the score in that like all the synthesizers it's like oof, it it's rough so i think it i'm is, watching cobra kai now i like it i didn't see the original movies but i'm liking cobra kai on netflix it's cheesy but i like it that checks out with what i've heard from other people I think this is better for relying more on soundtrack, probably because, you know, 80s rock, is, I, I would say, is a pretty solid genre, so it's always a decent fallback. I, I remember I added Johnny Be Good to my first iPod that I had, because I, like, had, like, one of those older iPods around the first time I saw this movie, and I know that was on the one playlist I made. The Power of Love, still a pretty good song. I don't remember anything else from it. Only time I paid attention to music was when it was focused on in the movie. Normally background music just 
it in my head it just goes in the background i don't really notice it the scene where he's playing the guitar I, I didn't really have a choice but to listen there so it was cool though i was bopping my head and then michael j fox went off script and started shredding he did he did i would say you don't really need the johnny b good scene to be in there ex like i don't quite understand why they wanted to go as hard as they did with like Hey, it's your brother, Marvin Berry. Listen to this. And it's like, Chuck Berry is hearing the song that he wrote. Like, wh what does that do? I, I don't understand why they did that. Like, um, it was his cousin. Ever. Right, but he, he no, right. his cousin calls Chuck Berry on the phone and like has him, plays him his own song. Like, why? Why not just have him play like Van Halen and call it good? <laughs> I don't know what that is. You don't know what Van Halen is? Jump? Isn't that a band? Okay. Wow. I'm I'm a little surprised. I don't know. I was born in the nineties and I, I know was born but... in the late nineties. Wait, I'm the oldest one here. Oh shit. Yeah, we're all born in the nineties, but you've never heard Jump by Van Halen? I find that kinda of hard to believe. I don't know what that is. You've definitely heard it just like walking in a mall at some point. There's no way you guys would be what are you, twenty five now? Twenty four? Twenty four, let's not jump up my age just yet. Okay. 72. There's, <laughs> there's no way you've gotten to be 24 and you... I, I, I can believe that you don't know what that song is, but you have definitely heard Jump by Van Halen. You keep saying the full name like this is going to jog my memory. I'm not expecting it to. You just... Go listen to the song. You've heard this before. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't matter. Anyway, he could have played some other 80s rock song and not... I don't understand why. Not Johnny Be Good. It's a great song. I don't. So yeah, keep Johnny Be Good. What about by all means. What about Jump from Van Halen? I think that would have been a good song. <laughs> yeah, you definitely. That's an inspired choice, Jelani. <laughs> right on you. Yeah, it took the words right out of my mouth. Um, <laughs> you could keep Johnny Be Good there, though. I just I don't understand why they were like, "Hey, wouldn't it be cool?" Like that just creates all sorts of time travel problems too, where it's like, so. Does Chuck Berry only know Johnny B. Good because Marty wrote this song? Or has Marty heard Johnny B. Good by Chuck Berry, plays it in the 50s, and now in this new version of the 80s, like, Chuck Berry still wrote that song but didn't actually? Like, wh what, what does that do? I, I just don't understand why they decided to do that. I don't know any of these names. Uh, you might as well be speaking a different language. Well, it's the song that he plays. You got Johnny and, and Chuck and, and Van and some person named Jump. I don't I don't know all these people either. Were they in the movie? I don't think they were in the movie. Marvin Berry is in the... Forget it. <laughs> Just... People who are listening know what I'm talking about. I don't need to explain this to you. <laughs> but that is a good point, and that is something that I think has kind of become a mean of and onto itself and has been for better or for worse back to the future has kind of become a standard in time travel because people always are like are we gonna back to the future it meaning are we gonna just have no consequences and have no reason for any of this and just confuse everyone or are we gonna try to have some sort of explanation and rule to follow and it's interesting i don't know why they just run with it but there's a few times throughout that movie where I just wonder, like, Marty wearing the Calvin Klein underwear, and he says he's Calvin. Like, when Calvin Klein underwears come around, is the mom just not going to be able to associate it? Like, is she going to forget? Like, what is she going to have? Like, uh, what what is that weird Bernstein effect? Is she going to have a Bernstein effect? Is she going to be like, where is, is it the Berenstein Bears or the Bernstein Bears? Oh, no. Mandela effect, that's it. Is she going to have a Mandela effect? I don't know. And then, like, he even saying, I understand it's supposed to be a sweet moment, but again, it just, if you think about what the movie, just about the movie, him being like, you know, if you ever have a son, and when he's five, he sets the carpet on fire, go easy on him. And then when that happens... Are they going to have deja vu? And the mom's even like, ooh, Marty, I like that name. Right. And then there's the big one that everyone talks about, which is him inventing the skateboard. So, like, did Marty McFly just invent the skateboard when he ripped that thing apart? I don't know. Yeah, I, I, the one that I bump on the most out of those is 
her deciding to name her kid Marty again, like, it's very strange. But that's a strange thing for, like, any normal human to do, though. Like, imagine, like, getting with, like, your, your lover, but you, you name your kid after somebody you knew in high school. What? Like, yeah, who? who you knew for a week? Who? Right. Although, I suppose you could that? argue that, like, in this new version, Marty is, like, the reason that George and Lorraine got together in the first place. So I suppose you could argue for that. But even so, it's a little weird. And they don't name their... Fr- I, don't, I don't know who what the older brother's name is, but Marty's the youngest. So it right. would kind of make more sense for them to name the oldest child that. I don't know. It's strange. And you could even, like, forgive it if you just cut that line. Marty, that's a nice name. Just cut that out and nobody has a question there. This, this is a whole lot of other unanswered questions, though. So. Yeah. If we're on time travel questions, I don't know if this exactly falls under that, but one thing that has stood out to me, and it's not a deal breaker, but I've found it very convenient that every significant thing in the parent's life, Doc's life, and the town all happens in the same week in 1955. That's a little convenient. No, that's great writing. I'm not saying it's, like, (laughs) terrible, but, like, when you take a step back, it's like, okay, this one week in 1955, Doc Brown discovers, like, gets the idea for time travel. Also, the lightning strikes the tower. Also, the Under the Sea the Dance, the sea dance. yeah. And I, I think there's another one that I'm not thinking of. But maybe, even if it's just those three, that's kind of a stretch. Like, two of those things. Because we do get the setup at the beginning where the the parents say, like, remember it was our first dance the night that the clock tower struck, or the, the lightning struck the clock tower. So they do establish it beforehand. So it doesn't feel that weird, but I've I've always felt like that was just a bit much is it okay if we get into setups and payoffs because that kind of ties into that yeah go yeah. ahead because that because setups and payoffs is like the main writing technique that i feel like this movie accomplishes the most because everything that happens in 1955 is set up in 1985 like that's pretty mm-hmm. obvious but they do a really good job of making the exposition in Act 1 feel organic, so that way it feels natural in Act 2 when he goes to the past. And, like, you get... I, I think both of you mentioned this before, like, there's pretty good exposition about, like, how we see his parents' dynamic, his dad's relationship with Biff... And then we go to 1955 and see, okay, it's always been this way. And you even get a couple of smaller things like the the principal, who's apparently always been bald or whatever. I'll, I'll ask this question and then answer it, and then I want to hear both of your answers. What do we think the usefulness of setups and payoffs in this movie are? I think the thing it accomplishes the most is that it shows how everything stayed the same. It makes everything feel kind of cohesive like you feel closure at the end because it doesn't really leave anything hanging but i almost want to say that like like the reason it feels so satisfying is just because of how many things are set up and paid off like the quantity i think is why we remember it over the quality like i don't know if it necessarily lends any greater meaning to like the things that are set up and paid off but i could hear arguments against that so what what do you guys think what like what what do the setups and payoffs how do they benefit or detract i didn't care i said earlier once once the parents were together i i stopped caring and then marty had the whole thing about trying to warn duck and he was trying to get him the letter, but Doc was like, no, I don't want to know about the future, Marty. I, I, I didn't care. And then he was like, I wore a bulletproof vest. What the hell, right? Haha, <laughs> screw time travel. 
that I think is the most 1980s aspect of this movie. Mm-hmm. Is at the end, it's like they give no reason to why in 30 years time Doc decided to change his like strongest principle in time travel, which is already super flimsy to begin with in this movie. And then he's just like, I figured, what the hell? And then the music plays, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> this is so, this is 80s to a T. If that came out, like that same thing happened in a movie today, it would be instantly memed. Oh, yeah, it would be a laugh riot in the theater. Uh, I also question, should this have caused a time loop? Because Marty saw him should. himself. And then that also made me question, has movie ever done time travel well? Uh, find out next week on Dragon Ball Z. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> Set up and payoffs for me in this movie, I agree. The movie's riddled with them. I think that's the movie's main function. I don't mind it because they're pretty not like obvious about it, but they're just it is they're just like this is what the movie is. So like, you can take it or leave it. And for what it's worth, I like you said, I think they do a good job masking it with the dialogue and whatnot and clever enough in set design. So when the parallel moments happen in the past, like at the dinner table in the eighties versus the fifties, there's enough kind of circularity for the audience to just kind of subconsciously take it in. And I think that's a triumph to that art department because everything with, I think it's the honeymooners they're watching and like the rolling TV to like the placement of people sitting is very well done. But yeah, I don't think it's anything like groundbreaking or anything that really warrants a super deep analysis. I think it's pretty on the surface with all of its callbacks and payoffs. When you see Marty and he's like, I don't know, what if they don't like what I'm giving, gonna give them or whatever? And then he goes back in time and sees his dad say the exact same thing. It's like, the movie's not being shy about it. Some of the setup with Marty is the only place where I feel like there's setups that aren't paid off. So, I, like, obviously there is the thing where he's like, I don't want to send in the record, and then you have the dad, I don't want to send my, I don't want anyone to read my books because, like, I can't face that kind of rejection, whatever. I think that line is a different place, but... Yeah, that's what they both say. But there's set up, like, Marty says it, and I think the principal and maybe one other character says in 1985, like, Marty's turning out like his dad. But then the reason that Marty screws up like, the way his parents met and all that, is because he's not like his dad. So I don't quite understand why they feel the need to emphasize or, like, tell us that, man, he's turning out just like his dad, except clearly he's very different when they when you compare the two of them in the 50s. Crispin Glover hams it up. Yeah. He like, does. To an, as an extreme degree. Jesus, man. Like, I don't think Give I've ever milk. seen... Chocolate. Chocolate. Oh. When oh. I watched it again, I said that line. I said chocolate. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't ham it up any more than the dude who plays Biff. No, Biff was... I don't, I don't want to say better, because his <laughs> No, Biff is, is definitely awful. the campiest one. Biff is schoolyard bully personified. Hey, butthead. Yeah. Knock, 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 knock. But Crispin, when he's at the dinner table before Marty time travels and he's laughing at the TV. Oh, my God, when he laughs at the TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And with his son, when his son kisses him on the head and he's like, ooh, you gotta comp- like loosen up that oil or whatever. And he goes, <laughs> <laughs> Well, there was such a thing in the 80s of like aggressively uh, lame dad. Like, you have the Ferris no, Bueller's dad I've is a huge example. No, never... Jesus Christ. The dad in Goonies in, like, the three moments he shows up is definitely in there. I think the dad in Sixteen Candles probably falls into that. Bill and Ted's dad's not so much, but that's also late 80s. But, like, that was kind of a thing in that era. Were, were the actors, like... Old or young in this movie? Did they just put makeup on when they were young or old? I don't... Because they, they clearly got 
both actors to play the younger and older version of themselves, but I don't I don't know which they put makeup on. Crispin Glover would have been twenty twenty one at the time of filming. Oh, so they put makeup on to seem older? Yeah. So when they were younger, that's how they really looked? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna say Biff they made look younger. Cause he looks the oldest out of the three of them. And then they didn't even bother with Christopher Lloyd. He's just the, the exact same in both eras. Uh, Doc Brown. Oh, well, he said he had more hair, so there's that. Yeah, but it's not even that much more. You think Doc Brown is just Professor Plum where he changed his name? Well, he definitely is. He's also the bad guy from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. <laughs> oh, yeah. The uh, judge guy. Yeah, he's the evil tune. And the uh, angel from Angels in the Outfield. That was the first thing I saw him in. Wasn't oh, Danny Glover in that? I think so. And very young Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Wow. What were we talking about? <laughs> the actor's <laughs> age. Oh, yeah. If we're oh, okay with that, I had one more question for setups and payoffs. I wanted to ask, like, what do we think the purpose of setups and payoffs are in just storytelling in general like why is it a thing we should do or is it that important to make you the audience feel accomplished for watching the movie hey that problem got solved and now i feel accomplished yeah and like i'm gonna talk about spider verse because i'm in love with spider verse but who isn't if you aren't um i I know i don't even feel sorry about it I think that has one of the best examples of a well-used setup and payoff for sure in recent movie history, and it's a leap of faith. That's a great one. The "I love you" to the dad is a great one, and of course, the shoulder touch. So hey, mm-hmm. that's hey. that's that's a great one. And um, there's something about with when you go into that dark room and the screen's that big and the sound's that large and you take in a story for two hours and you can plant little seeds that allow to your mind to take it in but if it's done really well you don't notice it and then if it's done even better it'll come back in a meaningful way and it's just it creates a visceral effect i think if they really layer it well within the character and the plot that they just spent two hours creating so when is it meaningful and when is it not is my question when you care about the character yeah and i also think it's one of those things where less is more like if you are constantly doing setup and payoffs it almost becomes like fanfare like as much as people love endgame endgame to me feels like a lot of fanfare a lot of setup and payoff a lot of all right guys here we go on your left we're gonna yeah yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna put everything that audience really wants into that movie because they are isn't it just one big payoff movie though pretty much one big payoff but when you dissect it it's a bunch of little payoffs that create one huge payoff yeah and also it references back to the future very heavily it it does it does i don't know if I fully agree with, like, you can do it too much because I think that is what we remember Back to the Future for, is that it just does it a lot. I I honestly am not sure. Like, one setup and payoff that I think is effective in Back to the Future is the conversation between Biff and uh, George where it's like the exact same thing in the 50s and the 80s. Like, if my handwriting was on your, or your handwriting was on my papers, McFly, I, I, I'll get expelled, whatever. Like, I see the purpose of that. Like, it's showing it's exactly the same then as it is now. Nothing has changed. But then there's other things where I don't know if it's actually serving any purpose. It's just kind of there to be like hey remember this line that line was said before so closure question mark i think there just has to be the tv show that they watch like why is like it's a it's a good little comedic moment like there's irony there with like what's a rerun but i don't feel like that's serving any larger purpose than just kind of being like a setup for a joke
I think that's more an Easter egg and just like, I put that just with the set design and just, I don't think, I think any TV show could have been playing on that TV. They just needed to have it be the same episode as they were watching in 85 to 55, just because I think the filmmaker was probably so determined to have the consistency between that just so that the parallel was so heavy. Like they're literally having dinner about Uncle Joey's parole and then you finally meet Uncle Joey and he's behind bars as a baby. That's always been my favorite joke in the movie. Get yeah. to those bars, kid. That's so messed up to say to a child. So, I think there's a, there's a lot that they're just trying to like keep together. My favorite payoff is him playing at the dance just because that's like the one thing he wanted to do. And the person was like, you're just too darn loud. We can't have you playing at the dance here in 1985. And then he has to play at the dance to save his own life. So that's that's one payoff that I feel they work in well. And cut to 21st century clubs where you can't hear yourself speak. Yes. Yeah. With Chuck Berry. <laughs> With Chuck Berry. Yeah, Chuck Berry, man. Oof. I want to test this with another endgame callback. Is I Am Iron Man a purposeful callback or is that just fan service? <laughs> I would be in the purposeful pool. So what purpose is it serving then? I think it's just the... Well, it's a, I'm looking at it two layers. My first layer, if you're looking at it on a practical layer, he is defeating the big evil that this character has been preaching about for the past... I don't even know how many movies Iron Man's in. And he finally has that moment. I think that on that layer is very purposeful and very intentional. I think allowing for it to be personified or symbolized on screen through the line, I am Iron Man, is fan servicey, but enough to the point where since it's still leaning into the character and his final arc, it kind of pulls a more visceral emotion and it's not so much of like a throwaway like some of the other references might have been like i not to jump to a different movie but it's fresher in my head like with no way home when willem defoe's like i'm quite a i'm a bit of a scientist <laughs> myself like that that doesn't that's just for the memes exactly i think exactly but i don't think i am iron man is that whereas something like that which is literally just for fan the memes service. is so clearly fan service mm -hmm. jelani what do you think of is it purposeful or not? Ditto with with Davidson. All all of all of it. The thing that's making me think it's purposeful, I guess, is that he's kind of it, when he says it at the end of the first Iron Man, he's kind of doing it to be like he, it's sort of like a vain thing. Mm -hmm. And then when he does it in Endgame, it's a moment of sacrifice. So like it is pointing to his arc. It also shows in the first one that secret identities aren't going to matter in the MCU, which is kind of true. Yeah. Well, and maybe it's also uh, to that point, like, that maybe he identifies more now as Iron Man than as Tony Stark. Mm. And I guess maybe that's completed by the end. I don't know. Maybe somebody could write a 10-page essay about that. But... You know, it was fan service Avengers Assemble. Okay, yeah, so yeah, that, that's that I think is basically service. just fan service. That's not harking back to anything. That's just people wanting that line to finally be on screen. And it's cool. They earn it. So A lot of things off. in that movie are earned. Yeah. Have either of you seen the uh, animated movie The Croods? No. no. Not fully. Okay. Like the cave family or something, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm bringing it up because that's a movie. I, I don't love it. But that is definitely a movie where it also has a ton of, like, lines that are set up and used one way earlier on. And then in the third act, they bring them all back and they're kind of, like, showing growth for the characters. I just was going to make a comparison there. What about B-movie when he his, his parents tell him not to fly in rain and then it rains and he's like, I can't fly in rain. Word? Um, <laughs> no, I, I think it's a good. I think it's a good point. It's just no. I I, I, I shouldn't have said it like that. That is a good point. It's just that it's a good movie. <laughs> um, 
I'm all over the place today. I'm sorry. I, I think it's I think it's a valid point though because you set up a danger, like that is doing something functional. I don't think it's doing anything great, but like that is a purposeful thing. The B movie does everything great, Evan. Well, sure, if if you want it to. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to take a stance on that. People are, are too opinionated about the B-movie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you don't want them to swarm you? Uh, <laughs> uh, that hurt. Did it sting, Jelani? <laughs> <laughs> One other example I wanted to point to is the way that some of the world building is done in the Harry Potter series. And I don't know if we want to qualify this as setups and payoffs, but like in that series, more so the books than the movies, whenever the kids learn about like some specific spell or plant or potion in class, like that can, it's usually presented as just like, we're going to learn this thing today, but usually not always, but oftentimes it'll come up later. Like, the classic example is Wingardium Leviosa. They learn that, and then, uh, like, a week later in the time of that movie, Ron uses that spell to knock out the troll. But then they do it with, like, a few other things, with, like, I think the Mandrakes in the second book. Yeah, the werewolf in the third one. Yeah, the werewolf in the third one. There's some good setups. The fourth one, they there. do all the torture spells, and then Harry gets it from Voldemort in the end. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a that's a big one with the unforgivable curses. Yeah, like the, but I think what is great about the way setups and payoffs are done there is that much like Back to the Future, they're kind of disguised. So it kind of just seems like just this fun little world building thing where it's like, "Oh, this is a cool spell." But then it actually ends up serving a purpose later. Um, and to compare to at least one other thing from that series, the first Fantastic Beasts movie has a lot of world building done, but it kind of only exists for its own sake. All those creatures that are in that movie, like, they don't really matter outside of, like, Newt Scamander playing Pokemon for two hours trying to catch them. So I guess maybe that could be an example of, like, comparing setups and payoffs. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it all comes down to these stories have a strict structure, and the structure allows for exploitation and consistency. And when it's consistent, I think there's an effect and there's an arc that can be put on display. But, I mean, I'm sure there's, you know... A bunch of other movies where the inconsistencies make these callbacks lessen because setoffs aren't paid off and you're like well we just left that storyline like i love ridley scott and not to get off back to the future but i watched the house of gucci recently and there's a lot in that movie that it's like one movie for two thirds and then it's just completely goes a hard right turn and like Lady Gaga's not on screen for a lot of it after that. Like, she carries almost every scene until, like, the halfway through the second act. And then it focuses, like, a lot on Adam Driver. And it's just such a weird shift. And I'm like, none of this is paying off what we just set up. And it, it doesn't, you don't feel fulfilled. I don't know if that's necessarily setups and payoffs there, though. I was definitely underwhelmed by House of Gucci. But... To me, that felt more like it falling prey to basic biopic things. But in either case, like, I think both the things we're talking about have to do with the satisfaction of an ending. I've definitely heard a couple of professors say, like, nobody will really remember, like, a bad second act if you really deliver on the ending. And I think there is truth to that. So... Maybe that is part of, like, the setup payoff thing. Yeah. Is that, like... Because I guess you could you could almost argue that every story is just one large setup and payoff. Mm -hmm. Mysteries was another thing I, I wanted to bring up because 
I think the difference between a mystery that hits well and one that doesn't, or at least a major difference, is does the reveal involve things that the audience has already seen? I think I've mentioned this on a couple of other episodes, but one technique that really annoys me is what Guy Ritchie does a lot, where he'll have a reveal, but it involves him showing you like half of a scene where you saw some of it, but he didn't show you all of it. And then in the reveal, he shows you what you didn't see. So it's like, yes, it's a reveal, but also you cheated because that's not you like putting something under our nose that we didn't notice. You just straight up didn't show it to us. So I think that does reduce the satisfaction or like how how much that reveal can hit. I guess maybe that's the main thing is just like if you tie elements back that counts for something even if it's not even that effective i guess or purposeful i said it was going to be one last question but i'll throw in another one can either of you think of like examples of like a callback that you really roll your eyes at not necessarily in back to the future I'm going to take that as a no. No, it's, um, it's going to take time. I, I, yeah, have to, I, I honestly I have can't think of any either, but I feel like I have. Spot. I know there I are like some, but like I, I try to block out the things I don't like. It's probably st- something that I haven't rewatched ever. I feel like there's definitely some kid's movie that does that, that I'm just not thinking of. Um, the only thing I'll add is that I did see this time you mentioned it earlier david but i really felt a tom holland vibe from michael j fox in this because this was the first time i'd seen it since knowing who tom holland was and they feel really similar i think yeah i think they fit the same kind of slot in hollywood Mm -hmm. confused yeah confused like twinkie white boy (laughs) teen heartthrob well their voices are even kind of the same God, you can't be serious. <laughs> God, you're so, you're so, you're so. Uh, you guys gotta play, cause, cause if you don't play. <laughs> oh man, Davis is the wildest shit. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Uh, so some upcoming episodes, not necessarily in this order, but probably Beetlejuice and Steve Jobs is my next pick. Check out our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to our Patreon for $1 a month where we have bonus episodes. Uh, Our merchandise is on Zazzle. Our logo is by Kelsey Hendry. You can follow the show on Twitter at intanalysis18. I am on Twitter at ev underscore Wes. And where are both of you? I'm on Twitter at Jelani T. Kelly. And I changed my Instagram name to Jelani T. Kelly as well. So it's easy to find all one word. Oh, my YouTube base, Phoenix, still. That's it. I am on Twitter nowhere. And <laughs> I am on healthy. Instagram at David's Instagram account. David just posts shit to his story. I do. (laughs) I post a lot of shit to my story that I just see throughout my day that I just like to spread around and it goes to whoever it goes to and hopefully it brightens their day. Recently I posted a rest in peace meatloaf meme and it was Rosie O'Donnell's face. (laughs) I also posted a meme where it was was Betty White but it was uh, Bob Saget. Bob Saget asked Betty White what's for dinner and Betty White says meatloaf. Oh, wow. I don't get that. <laughs> because Meatloaf because died. all three of them died recently. Who's Meatloaf? The, he's the rock and roll guy. When we watch Rocky Horror Picture Show, we'll, we'll get to him. You'll meet Meatloaf in Rocky Horror Picture Show. He's also in Fight Club. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the only thing I know him from. Should I know who Meatloaf is, Evan? Hmm? Van Halen? I'm more surprised. Chuck Berry. Van Halen. Chuck Berry? Hmm? Well, I know Chuck Berry because of this movie, but uh, I know Van Halen because I've lived in America since the 1980s and have a radio. Since the 1980s? You're that old? See, that's the problem. You have a radio. I don't have a radio. Look, 
iTunes didn't exist for the first however many years of my life. iTunes has always existed forever. Well, uh, interesting, because we'll go into that on Steve Jobs in a couple episodes. Who plays Steve Jobs and Steve Jobs? Uh, it's Kutcher. the Michael Fassbender one. Oh, okay. Uh, there's the other one with Ashton Kutcher. Uh, I'm doing the Michael Fassbender one. Oh, Jobs. Or... It's just Jobs. That's the Ashton Kutcher yeah. one, right? And the, is this the Aaron Sorkin one? Yep. It's going to okay. be our first Sorkin episode. I, I thought you wanted to do the episode. social network for that. I wanted to watch Andrew Oh, Garfield. no. We're going to do the social network someday. But we're, but this is... I, I don't want to jump in with his biggest thing first. I want to start with Steve Jobs. Same reason I started with Dunkirk as our first Nolan. Ew. <laughs> Well, you don't want to do the best Ew. ones first. That's gross, man. Put that away, Nolan. <laughs> what? Put your Dunkirk away. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Let, let's sign off. All right. Uh, see you guys next time. And uh, I don't know where we're going. We we don't need roads. Yeah, that's true. If your mom tries to bang you, stay away. Yep. Yeah. yeah. W- words of it. you heard it here first. Actually, Ooh. hopefully it wasn't first here, <laughs> because then there's problems. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this has nothing to do with anything, but I really want some like soft pretzels right now. Interesting. Or, um. <laughs> Straight from the mall. Straight from the mall. I'm sorry. Continue. But. So, <laughs> <Soft> <laughs> <pretzels>. <laughs> going off of soft pretzels. <laughs> <laughs> okay.